Hey guys, so um, I've noticed that when talking to uh, those who don't accept evolution or climate change, that there's a lot of confusion about how science actually works. So here I want to address a few of those issues. Before I do anything, I want to encourage anybody interested in climate change to watch the videos by Green Man 3610 I don't have any sort of expertise in global warming, but what I do have is an understanding of how basic science in the field of um, neuroscience at least works. Um, so first, the issue about uh, scientific consensus. You see, an overwhelming majority of scientists accept that evolution and global warming are real. There is not a single scientific society that rejects man-made climate change or evolution. Every prestigious university from Harvard, Princeton, Stanford, Oxford, Cambridge, all accept that the reality that the there's a reality of man-made climate change, and they also teach evolution. So. Does this mean that you should automatically accept evolution just because all, all the scientific societies do? Well, of course not. But you have to realize that there's a reason for this. If you notice um, in my first video that I ever made about the uh, deception of creationism, I made this point about how, evolu uh, how, of how evolution is nearly universally accepted among scientists. But in the videos since, I have proceeded to show the tons of evidence that have convinced scientists that evolution is real. So in the end, Nothing is more important than evidence, but this evidence also shapes a consensus. Um, in terms of evidence for global warming, I'll post a link to uh, an editorial in the extremely prestigious uh, journal Science, which uh, mentions that scientific peer-reviewed uh, peer uh, research papers that conclude that global warming is man-made and 900 that conclude that it is in fact warming, the planet is in fact warming. That is a lot of evidence. But how important is this uh, scientific consensus? Are scientists al always right? Well, of course not. They're human beings, so they make mistakes. But the thing is, scientists have the expertise and the training to make fewer mistakes than the average layman. Uh, the scientists know that uh, the observer can unintentionally fudge data, so they do double-blind studies to get over that um, obstacle. They know that mistake hap mistakes happen, so they get over that obstacle by um, only accepting evidence that is repeatable. In order to make the ex experiments repeatable, they post everything in the method section of the paper uh, that they're publishing, even the exact company and model of the microscope that they're using. They also use measured controls, positive and negative controls, and always include the margin of error. So when people with this much expertise reach a consensus, that means something. It means a denier should at least be humble enough to look at what swayed these scientists. Now one rebuttal that deniers have is that scientists have a mob mentality to accept uh, what they're told. Um, however, the thing that makes scientists special and I have personal experience and frustration about this, is that scientists are also trained to be extremely skeptical. Now, being skeptical doesn't mean you automatically reject an idea, just because it's profound. Being skeptical means that you always remain wary of reaching a conclusion until the evidence is in. The more profound the conclusion, the more evidence you need. That's it. Scientific skepticism is clear in many fields. So why are the scientists in this particular field of climate change so different? In fact, they're not. The same scientists in NASA that accept global warming also produce valuable knowledge. The same editors in prestigious nature that, that publish uh, papers about global warming also frustrate my colleagues in my research lab in the field of neuroscience and genetics by asking them to do one more experiment because they're too skeptical about the data and the conclusions that they reach. Furthermore, the argument about mob mentality might make sense with evolution because evolution has been around for 150 years, so maybe that makes that sense. But it doesn't make sense for global warming, because until very recently, many scientific organizations did not accept global warming, or they didn't take it too seriously. They only shifted their position when the evidence really started coming in for one side. So if they have a mob mentality, why didn't they defy, uh, why did they defy global warming just very recently, just a few decades ago? In fact, we see the same pattern in all of science. For example, there was a, a debate about whether the universe originated from the Big Bang or whether it was always in a steady state. There were two camps in this uh, field uh, of science where scientists were on one side or the other until the evidence really started coming in for the Big Bang. And now almost all scientists accept that the Big Bang theory is correct. 
So did these scientists change their mind because they have a mob mentality? Does this mean that the Big Bang is not real? If, if the concept that applies, if the argument applies for global warming, it must also apply for um, the Big Bang. The next issue is whether these scientists are being suppressed. There's a robust debate about the smallest things. I'll post a paper which um, illustrates the debate behind the transport of slow actin fibers. Even a topic as obscure as that, scientists are vigorously debating. So where is the evidence that scientists are actively suppressing other scientists that do not conform in uh, climate change? You might point to the emails about um, from ClimateGate, but I can show you a link to the prestigious journal Nature that debunks these emails. There is essentially no evidence of suppression, so deniers rely on speculation. When, for example, Nature reaches the conclusion that the emails have absolutely no relevance, to, skeptics now start pointing fingers at Nature. But they can only reach two conclusions about um, Nature. Either the editors are all imbeciles who do not understand what good science is, or they know what good science is, they know what they're doing, and they're actively su suppressing suppressing uh, information. But we know they're not imbeciles. They're extremely rigorous and skeptical when it comes to neuroscience, my own experience. I will post the paper my colleague published about dopaminergic neurons in um, the journal Nature. We popped champagne bottles when we found out that it was going to get published. I'll also post another paper um, published in Nature that has an astounding conclusion that we have, a loca we have the location of the decision-making neurons in monkeys. This is a huge conclusion, so it requires a lot of evidence. If you reach the paper, you will see that they offer and rebut every single possible alternative they could think of. They say things like, well, maybe Factor X influenced our results, so we conducted an ex experiment to see if it did, and we found out that it could not have influenced. So they must have spent years on these experiments, and that is good science. Well, obviously, since we know that's good science, the only conclusion a denier can reach is that the editors know what good science is, but they're actively suppressing it in the case of global warming. But for some reason, they're not suppressing it in the case of biology. Now we're in conspiracy uh, territory. What is the motivation for the journals to publish bad science in the field of climate change, but not in neuroscience? There really isn't one. The journals don't see an extra dime, uh, regardless of what topic they're supporting or they're suppressing. But if nature is so corrupt, you cannot trust um, that dopaminergic neurons exist, can you? You can't trust any conclusion in biology that this prestigious journal makes in biology. Well, now the, the, the conspiracy theorists, the theorists don't want to go that far. They don't want to implicate other fields of science, because then that just gets too cumbersome. So maybe it's the scientists, not the editors, that are the current ones. So the ex best explanation I've heard uh, that, that is supporting um, is that um, when scientists support climate change, there's a huge funding for their research. So there's an incentive for them to be corrupt and uh, produce information supporting climate change. Well, that might be true, except this same argument can apply for basic science in other fields like biology. Uh, my Columbia University, where I work, is an example. They have a $3 billion budget just for the medical campus alone. It spends $500 million on just basic science, nothing but basic science research in biology. My lab is government-funded, so it's not included in that $500 million uh, budget. But we still have two pieces of equipment that are, half a million, that are worth half a million dollars each. How do we convince the government to give us a, a half a million dollar piece of equipment each, so one million dollars total. Well, the thing is, we produce good science. So producing positive results is an incentive to get more money in biology, just like it is in climate change. Does this mean my professor is an evil genius conspiring against all the values of science? Does this mean that everything in biology is wrong and that dopaminergic neurons do not exist? If climate change scientists are so corrupt, then why aren't biologists or geneticists corrupt since they have the same exact motivation and the same exact incentive? This is the problem with conspiracy theories. Once you start implicating one group of people, you have to extend, extend it to the other group which has the same motivation. And then it starts making no sense since it encompasses everybody. And it becomes impossible to stop.